as an Intel guy, you obviously got to tell the truth, all right? And and you got to really study your facts and know your facts, and go in there and, and make sure you're saying correct things. But beyond being correct, as you get to higher levels, you know, you're just not briefing a squadron on targets or something, but you're, you're at a higher level of thinking when people are developing policy. It's just not telling facts. You got to pitch what the narrative is. What's the story? Okay. And, and what's the dominant narrative? Now, we talked over dinner about my being from Pittsburgh and having Steelers season tickets, but I'm going to use a Washington Redskin metaphor here. I, I beg forgiveness in advance. <laughs> all right? Two or three years ago, the Redskins were horrible. Not that they're much better now, all right? <laughs> but if you looked at the Redskins two or three years ago and said, hey, what's wrong with those guys? I could give you four facts, all of which were true. The owner meddles too much. The coach doesn't have the respect of the players. The quarterback will never play to pro standards. And the offensive line is weak. All four of those sentences are true. Which is the dominant narrative? Which is the one that matters? Which is the one you should work on? Well, obviously it's the owner, but that's hard to do. Okay, so you change, they change coaches. Okay, now keep that thought. What's the dominant narrative? What's the dominant narrative in Libya? Okay, back on St. Patrick's Day, we thought the dominant narrative was oppressed and oppressor. I believe that's true. No, I'm sorry. I believe that this is a battle between oppressed and oppressor is a true fact. I'm not convinced it's a dominant narrative. This could be east-west, this could be have-have-not, and I'm beginning to fear that this is tribe-tribe, and not just oppressed and oppressor. So when you go to brief the president on things like <coughs> the Arab awakening, you've got to go in there with what's the dominant story. It's easy for us, given our political culture, to view every one of these through the lens of the march of democracy. That lens is correct, I love that lens. Okay. That lens is part of who I am as an American. But as an intelligence officer, it may not be the lens I want to emphasize to the president. Stay, I'm going to get to Syria and Saudi Arabia in a minute. St stick with Libya. Okay? This thing all started, and one of the arguments was, well, you've got you to arm, you arm the rebels. And everyone said, oh, not so sure, not so sure. Don't know who those guys are. And everyone would point to Benghazi, which is where the rebels are headquartered, and said, I don't know who they are. Who are those guys? was the question being asked of intelligence. Now I suspect, now I suspect, an additional question being asked of intelligence is pointing to Tripoli and saying, who are those guys? We're approaching day 100 of NATO bombardment. This can't just be the Qaddafi kids and some African mercenaries. They've stayed in the field. They've stayed, they've managed unit cohesion. They've changed tactics. They're still there. I need an explanation. Why do these guys have legs? What's, why are they sustained? So that's the issue, okay? What's the dominant narrative? It's always oppress and oppressor. It's clearly always got a flavor of Democrat and autocrat. But what else do you have? In Bahrain, clearly Democrat and autocrat. But in a heartbeat, it's Sunni Shia. In Yemen, clearly, less clearly, but still, Democrat and autocrat. But in a half a heartbeat, it's tribe on tribe. Previously mentioned to me a very, very interesting story. The first time you briefed President Obama on all the covert important operations going on around the world. If you're comfortable, would you care briefly describing it to the audience since it's a fascinating story? Sure. Um, I was not the DCI. Right. I was the DCIA when the DCI used to run all of American intelligence. The DCIA runs CIA. Now, for most of our history, they were the same guy. So we just called him by the higher title, DCI. But he actually had two jobs. DCI, Director of Central Intelligence, big hand, little map, runs all of it. DCIA runs that agency at Langley. Okay. With the advent of the DNI, I'm, I'm really sorry to bring you into this discussion. All right. <laughs> With the advent of the DNI, the DNI now does the big map thing, and I got to be the director of CIA. By the way, I have no idea how my predecessor, I, I am the first guy to occupy the office I occupied who was not the head of the American intelligence community. I was just the head of the CIA, okay? I cannot imagine how those other guys did the other thing. 
Okay, I work uh, anywhere between 26 and 27 hours a day on, on CIA. Okay. So I've not met the president-elect. Uh, that's being handled by the DNI, appropriately. By law, the DNI is the president's senior intelligence advisor. I'm just the DCIA, but I do run covert action. And sooner or later, you got to go tell the president-elect about covert action. And so we, um, we had an appointment to go to Chicago in mid-December. And, and we were trying to literally fly under the radar here. I flew in one of our own jets uh, out of Langley, went into a hair about midnight, drove down, went into a hotel room. We were going to meet the president-elect and the vice president-elect and key members of the staff, his staff, the next morning in the FBI building in Chicago. So I am, um, you know, kind of coming in stealthy, getting out of the hotel, getting the bags, walking in. I mean, there's no one in the reception area. It's dark, middle of December, Chicago. You get the feel. And my chief of security comes up to me and says, uh, we've got to change the venue. I said, Rich, what, what are you talking about? I said, we, we can't meet in the FBI building tomorrow. Oh, Rich, come on. Why can't we meet in the FBI building? They're arresting the governor in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> And it's just not a good thing. <laughs> I mean, we're trying to fly under the radar, and we'd be there, hey, there goes the DCIA next to the governor on his perp walk. I mean, <laughs> so we met in a much smaller office, and, and I briefed President-elect Obama and Vice President-elect Biden, uh, Rahm Emanuel, uh, Tony Blinken, who is uh, the Vice President's National Security Advisor, Jim Jones, who was going to be and was for a while the President's National Security Advisor, I, one, of our, one or two other staffers, and I sat across the table. I, I was closer to the president than I am to you. It was a very narrow table. It's, a very, it's called a SCIF, a secure, Special Secure Intelligence Facility, and you know, so you can say big secrets and not worry about being eavesdropped. And I had one map of the world and had little, like, cartoon bubbles, you know, where, where the cartoons show the dialogue. I had cartoon bubbles for each of the covert actions, and I walked the president-elect and vice president-elect through all, all the covert actions. And I began by saying, Mr. President-elect, thank you very much for your time. Uh, this is very valuable. This is very important for us because all of what I'm going to tell you today has been ordered by the President of the United States. But, Mr. President-elect, they come from the office of the President, not from the person of the President. And so unless you tell us differently, on the afternoon of 20 January, every one of these is going to be chugging along. Now let me begin. And I kind of, that's called the attention-getting step. In, okay, when, when you're going to academic instructor school. And so I walked him through all, all the covert actions that we had.